I don't know if there's a key. Just think for, if it looks easy now, for years, all I did was think about don't fail, don't fail, you know? Mm -hmm. The whole thing, I think the reason I had such bad stage fright is because I thought about everything. How my wife, or how, how, yeah, how my wife at the time would think of me on stage. My parents, you know, am I going to forget lines? Am I, look at how I'm dressed. Do I look stupid? Am I going to, does my voice sound right? You know, Mm -hmm. once I got over that, I never have that anymore. I've never had stage fright since. That's never happened ever since, you know, I was in my early twenties, mid twenties. Um, it just doesn't happen anymore. And I think I just got to the point by doing this over and over and over again, failing over and over and over again, (laughs) where you just know, like, if I just have fun, it's going to be okay. Welcome to the Less Than Obvious podcast. I'm your host, Jim McDonald. Brian Crawl founded the Sacramento Comedy Spot, but that's not what he originally intended on doing. The comedy theater itself now offers shows six nights a week and classes in improv, stand-up, and sketch comedy four nights a week. It's the biggest comedy school in Northern California. That's quite an outcome for someone who was only trying to do a single show just to see how it would go. I started taking improv classes from Brian last August, and he ended up being on my short list of favorite people I met in 2017. I think you're going to see why. Quick warning, there are no adult themes, but there's definitely some adult language. Let's jump into the conversation. So, anyway. Yeah. How's it going, Brian? It's going good. (laughs) It's going good. Really good. (laughs) Good. Crazy, always, but good. So, having, you know, like watched over the last few months and and heard you in shows and and in class and stuff, I got the impression that this was not what you had intended to do from the beginning. No, no, not at all. So where was the decision <laughs> that took you down this road? Okay, well, let's start way back. Okay. Um, no, so I went. I initially went to college, and I um, I was a business major. Uh-huh. And um, joined the club. Yeah, and so uh, so I did that for three years. So what is that? Six semesters. Yeah, and uh, I had zero friends in college. I had no college experience. I hated my instructors. Um, I had taken uh, statistics, mm. and um, I hated the instructor that was the statistics teacher. So I dropped it midway through. I was like, "I'll just take it next semester, and I'll take it with a different, I'll take it with a different person. And everything will be fine." And uh, I show up that next semester, and it's the same goddamn teacher. <laughs> He decided, they're like, so-and-so's on sabbatical, so uh, Professor Siri will be teaching this class. And I was like, oh, shit. So I got up and I dropped out of college. <laughs> that was it. I was like, no, fuck this. I'm not going to do it. Can I say? Yes. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, so uh, yeah, that was it. And uh, I took a semester off. Yeah. I was living with my, with my mom at the time. And she said I could stay at the house as long as I was in school. And suddenly you weren't on in school. So I lied to her for an entire semester. So what I did is I would wake up every morning at 6 o'clock and get ready for school uh-huh. and then take off and leave and then go to a park and read for four or five hours in the car just because I didn't want to get kicked out of the house and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh-huh. I, I wasn't necessarily trying to get into any trouble or anything like that. I just didn't know where to go. So I read books about Charlie Chaplin. And uh, Apollo moon missions, <laughs> uh, novels, just uh, for an entire semester, and then decided to be a theater major after that. And uh, for the first time in college, I had it felt like I always tell people it was like a comfortable pair of shoes. I'm like, oh, I'm in the right place. Like this, this is where I need to be. Um, so I uh, theater major, and then it was uh, after. It was after college, Got finally got my uh, degree, and I was sitting in a bar with a friend, and he's like, what are you going to do now? Because I wanted to be Hollywood. I wanted to go to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be in movies. And uh, uh, my friend was like, what are you going to do now? I was like, well, I can't really do anything right now. You know, I should probably get a you know, job that pays bills and stuff <laughs> like that. He's like, well, you know, if you're going to do a production, though, because I wanted to maybe start a production company and do some plays, but I, yeah. I, I hate community theater. I mean, not now, but I did then. <laughs> so, so he goes, well, you know what you should do is you should start a sketch comedy group. And I was like, 
all right, yeah, let's do that. I mean, maybe it's because we were drinking. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, start a sketch group. And I'm like, yeah, I have no experience. Let's do that. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, I've got the name for you. We're gonna, you should name it the Free Hooch Comedy Troupe. And I was like, yeah. So the next day I called him and I was like, yeah, I think I might do that sketch. I've always, I've always liked sketch. We could figure it out. And he said, what? And he goes, <laughs> he goes, oh, I don't want to be a part of it. I just, I just thought that's what you should do. I was like, oh, really? Uh, okay. John Thanks. Ketching, thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. If John Ketching only knew how he uh, changed my entire life, that would be it. So I don't know if I made a decision to get into comedy. I think... I just did it. It, it just happened. Just, it just kind of happened. And um, I, f- the plan was to do one sketch comedy show, like like a play, like produce a sketch comedy show and then move on to something else. So we did this free hooch comedy troupe and we put together a show and we were good. It was a, like not, it wasn't great, but it was raw and mm-hmm. it was fun. Mm-hmm. And and we had a packed house for our first show because all of, you know we still had it was college we still had friends yeah and so people showed up and it was really good I mean there were parts that were crappy but there was a lot of good parts in it and uh, we met the weekend after the first show and I said well do you guys want to do another one so maybe we should do this monthly we'll just put out a monthly sketch show and everyone voted and decided we'd do it weekly oh. So we did um, the first year, which is like 2001 or something like that, we did um, a brand new one-hour show every week for 52 weeks. And uh, Wow. But it was cool because we learned how to write sketch and how to perform and you know what was funny and what was crossing the line and mm-hmm. what, you know, what was good, what was bad. So it was really valuable. But again, I didn't really make that decision. It was kind of made for myself, you know, and- then all of a sudden I had a kid, like about the same time, uh-huh. unexpected, and it was like, well, I don't want to move to L.A. with a kid. It's, you know, like right. trying to find a job and trying to balance acting, and I was like, well, I guess I'll stay here. The plan was to be a teacher, mm-hmm. go back to school, and I found out you can't get a, at the time, you couldn't get a teaching degree with a, a theater degree. You couldn't get a teaching because it was a BA and not a, or what? It's for some reason they didn't give. Uh, I can't think of the right word. What is it? Uh, teaching credential. That's what it is. Uh-huh. You can't get a teaching credential when you had a, a theater degree. If, if you have an English degree, you can oh. get a teaching. Degree. So what happened was, I mean, that's like the closest to drama. Yeah. So I was just going to be like a high school teacher. I was like, that'll be fine. I'll do this, you know, comedy uh-huh. stuff at night. But um. I would have to go back to school and get another degree that you can get a teaching degree with. And I was like, well, well shit, are you kidding me? So what was this all for? Why? Now, now you can do it. Yeah. Now you can get, uh, you can get a, a, a teaching credential, but. Because there's enough of a shortage now. I think I so. Well, and that, 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 and you had people who didn't know anything about theater teaching theater classes, which is the right. stupidest thing. I mean, I had a, I had a choir teacher teaching my theater class mm. when I was in uh, when I was in high school. So again, none of these things. I never really made any of these decisions. So it's, I just felt like I was, you know, careening around like in a pin, pin, uh, pinball machine, and, and life choices were just being made for me. But I was good at it. Yeah, and I I really wanted to keep doing it. So you kind of got dragged along into it, sort of. <laughs> yeah, just kicking and screaming a little bit. I don't, I don't know if it was because I enjoyed it. I really yeah. did. I don't know if it was kicking and screaming. It was more like, um, it was like I kept making plans, and then all of a sudden a wall would go up, and I'd kept adjusting those plans, and then at this, and then over time it was just like, well, I like this. Maybe I can make this a thing, you know. Mm-hmm. But again, even like doing comedy. I didn't open up the comedy spot because I wanted to open up a comedy theater. I opened up the comedy spot because we couldn't find any place in town that was fun to perform in. It was always mm. in bars, and you would always have to contend with drunks and right. bands playing in the next room and a koi pond playing over your <laughs> set. And you know, I swear we had a we had, we had a place where we had to unplug a koi pond before the show because it was so loud during the show. Oh my god! We had to put one person in charge of plugging the koi pond back in. Because one time we forgot, and they're like, you know, you're going to kill the koi if you don't. <laughs> so we're like, all right, well, you're in charge of <laughs> plugging in the koi pond afterwards. So, yeah, it was like none of this, none of it. I, I just wanted a place for the, like the comedy spot was just built because we wanted a place where we had control. Hmm. And, um, I mean, we even went to Punchline way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And we're like, hey, we got this thing, and it's uh, bringing in people. Can we perform here? 
And they said, uh, no, <laughs> no, go for, <laughs> screw you. It was like, okay, all right, bye bye. So, um, so that's again, like, it was just because of this and that and this, and then all mm. of a sudden, you know, all, we have a place and we're starting to do comedy out of a, our own building. So, so you did theater in high school, yeah, like the whole time. Uh, so just business for those three semesters, and then from there on out, it was mostly all theater classes because I had all my GE stuff out of the way. So. I mean, in high school, though. In high school, um, if you would have told me that I'd be a comedian, I would have. I mean, I wanted to be a millionaire. <laughs> that's what I wanted. To, I don't know how I was going to do it, but that's what I wanted to do. Um, I did take theater in high school, and I had fun, but I was a really terrible actor. Really? Yeah, I was terrible. Um, I was really impressed by everybody else that was there, and uh-huh. kind of in awe of the people who were taking uh, theater in high school. But man, I, yeah, I was bad. I think it was a confidence thing. Um, even when I started doing comedy uh, on a regular basis, I had really bad, um, all through college too, um, I had really bad uh, stage fright. Yeah. To the point where I would walk on stage and my entire body would start to seize up and my arm would You mentioned that yeah, in class. My arm would like press up against my chest where I couldn't pull my arm away from my chest. My legs would do the same and then it just took a couple seconds and then everything would relax. But yeah, I would walk on stage and I'd it was um it was terrible. It was just it would have I'd have to like breathe through it. I couldn't do any lines or move naturally or anything like that. Wow. And um it, it even happened. I, I think I even told the class. It even happened when I would be walking across the street, like at a crosswalk. Just people looking at me on a crosswalk, walking across the street. All of a sudden, it'd be like Ugh! everything would seize up, and it would affect my walk. So it would look like oh I was limping God. across the street. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. Is- so yeah, I was not a good actor in in high school, and I was the funny guy in college. They would just put me, they wouldn't let me be in the main stage. They always put me out. There's a stage at Sac State. It's called the Studio Theater. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's like banishment from the regular theater department. It's all the way across campus. And that, but that's where I learned to do comedy, really, because uh-huh. I did all the comedy plays. They, they wouldn't put me in the dramas. They would put me in the comedies out. <laughs> Student directed comedies way across campus. You know, that's where Brian should be. So fine. It was great. Uh, that's interesting to, that you were <laughs> kind of relegated like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my friends all were on the main stage, you yeah. know, and I always would audition. But I think a lot of the the most of the main stage uh, stuff they were directed by the professors. And I think they had mm-hmm. an idea who they were going to cast before before they even had auditions. Yeah, but sometimes they probably just pick the shows based on who they think is available, or right? Whatever, yeah. So yeah, but when they were I, all better than me too. So I did in three and a half years of high school, I think I did 12 shows. Really? Yeah. So I didn't, I wasn't on stage in every single one of them, yeah. but most of them. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, we did music. But see, the I, I was at one high school for um, two years for, for drama, and I only, I think I only did, uh, I think I only did one, one year of drama there. And then I just, I didn't like the teacher. She didn't yeah. like me, and it was going to be difficult to get cast. Right. Uh, anything, even though I was in like three shows that first year. Uh, and then I started going to the high school across town that had a real drama department. It had a theater and the whole, the whole nine yards. And so I just kind of did everything that came up really after that. Oh yeah. 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 I I was afraid. (laughs) Really? (laughs) I mean, I, my biggest fear and it, and it's, and it's still, I mean, if I had to do it again today, it would be the same problem. If I had to give a speech that I, that I was, that I'd memorized Mm -hmm. or whatever, it'd be the same thing. It's the, that I have had it happen like twice where I completely went up, Uh just went up hard and just stood there like a deer in headlights (laughs) and I couldn't remember where the fuck I was supposed to go from there. Yeah. And you know, I, I was usually on stage with pretty good people, and that that high school did um, the community theater was also there. So we did we did like half community theater shows yeah. and half high school shows. Yeah. So that's why I was, had the uh, opportunity to do a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you were usually on stage with pretty good people, and they could help you get back on track. Yeah, you know the you know all the tricks. Yeah. You know where you turn the line around or you ask the question again or whatever to, to get the person uh, going again. Yeah. 
And so that was that was my biggest fear, other than auditioning, which I hated. Yeah. I just super hated it. I always felt, and I'm I'm not a good cold reader, even now. Yeah, uh, I practice actually some, sometimes if I'm because when I'm doing voiceovers for for this show, yeah. sometimes I just get I bite the shit out of my tongue or the inside <laughs> of my mouth trying to get and and I usually know that that's what I need to rewrite. Yeah, because it's not flowing. Yeah, very because well. you're trying to say something that you normally wouldn't say. Or, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, when I audition now, or I don't really go on too many auditions. I was with a casting agency for a while. Yeah, and um, I was really nervous, nervous at first. But then I was just like, you know what? Screw this. If they like me, they like me. Why, why get nervous about this thing? Mm-hmm. And then as soon as I started to not care about it, that's when I started getting booked for for, for jobs and everything. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I see, there is something to this. So well, that's that. I guess that's helpful. It's it's you're hewing closer to yourself and not caring so much about what other people are going to perceive. Well, in casting directors, when you go into f- for a show to, to audition for anything, they are looking for something. They already have it in their mind who right. they want it. Right. So if you don't fit that mold, you're not going to convince them by being the best person in the room. You could be the best person in the room. They're going to cast who they have in their mind. Mm. And so that's why I was just like, well, I'll do my best during this audition and have fun. And if they like me and they want to work with me, great. But if they don't, well, then move on. You well, know? in reality, they don't want to have to work that hard. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I think that's true kind of in any job, though. Sure. If you're going to, the, mo- the most likely suspect is the, the person that's going to get hired most well, of the time. And like me, I want to work with people that are fun. You right. know, so like when I cast for things, you know, now, now that I'm kind of in that driver's seat, I. I, I just want to cast. I want to cast people who want to have a good time that yeah. I I enjoy working with. Not that I have to. Um, you know, I just don't want to be in a situation where people make me unhappy. Yeah. You know, so I just I try to cast people that I that I think are talented and fun. And even if they're not the most talented person in the room, I'd rather take the person I have to work with a little bit um, than the person that you know is going to be a monster to be working with all the time. Mm-hmm. So. I think I remember you saying that there was a, a small spot on Broadway yeah. that you guys were mm-hmm. in. It's very small. How many seats? It's at about 20 or 30. It mm-hmm. was um, uh, 17th uh, 17th and Broadway. It was the only thing that we could really afford. Uh, so it had no central heat and air. The bathroom was literally a closet that converted into a bathroom. Wow. So it's not ADA compliant or anything <laughs> like that. It was... Uh, it was just raw. It was probably asbestos in the walls, and mm-hmm. uh, there was black widows all over the place for some reason. We were always spraying for those, and uh, but it was great. It was our own space. We could do whatever the hell we wanted in it. And who were the early people involved in that? So there was uh, me and my, but still my best friend to this day is uh, Jeff Sloniker, who's in L.A. He left Free Hooch Comedy Troupe about a year afterward, and mm-hmm. we didn't open up. The comedy spot, and, and so it was like 2001 to 2005. We we went on it around the bars. Mm-hmm. 2005 is when we opened the comedy spot, but he was long gone. He had been in L.A. for years, but it was him, um, a bunch of people from uh, from college. So we had uh, Rebecca, uh, Dan, uh, Angie, Jason. They were all sex date theater people. Mm-hmm. Uh, my ex wife at the time was associated with a group. Um, Feels like I'm missing somebody. We cast somebody who never did a show. <laughs> so, but a lot of those people had even moved on. Even by the time we uh, we opened up the comedy spot on Broadway, it's just you know, most people weren't in this to be comedians, mm-hmm. but they did have a lot of fun doing it. So they would do it for a couple of years, and eventually they would just drop out, and we would recast. So like Mel was one of the, Mel Gelbart mm-hmm. was one of the first people. That was a recast person that's been with me for a long time. In fact, she remembers auditioning for Free Hooch when my first first child, Mackenzie, was in a car carrier sitting on the stage. Oh, wow. And now she's 16 years old. I was going to say she's like 16, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it was just um, – uh, it just uh, would recast people. So a lot of the original crew was already gone, but we had already recast people. Jason Casey was one of those people that came in really early on when we – Opened up the comedy spot on Broadway, and we were there for what four years, and then we moved to the Mars Building in two thousand nine. Mm-hmm. So, so what what was your day job during that time? Because obviously, we're not making an, no. enough money to uh, justify my day job. Not paid working. for uh, my day job paid for 
you know, me to live and my family to live, but it also paid the bills for the comedy <laughs> spot. <laughs> um, I think our lease for that place was, uh, I think, $900 a month or something okay. like that. And so we were doing classes, but we weren't making enough to really pay the bills. Uh-huh. The shows really didn't, you know, pay. They didn't make enough to really pay for that. So, I would supplement everything with my day job money. I was a skycap at the airport for almost nine years. So, wow. I was out in front of. Uh, I I was I worked for a contractor that worked for Southwest Airlines, uh-huh. and so I was right outside in front of Southwest Airlines. You know, I'd take people's bags to the curb, check them in, put them on the plane. Also took. Um, uh, wheelchair passengers up to gates, dropped them off, got, got them from the gates, took them down to baggage claim. Mm. So most of the money that I made was tip money because yeah. it was all um, minimum wage out of the curb. Right. But I made like a decent amount of money just off of tips, a really good amount of money off of <laughs> tips. The kind of amount of money that you wish you had, you know, like I look back in my 30s and I'm like, I was making more money in my 20s than I was in my 30s. So like I <laughs> Down the road, like maybe I'm skipping ahead here, but when I eventually quit that and did comedy first time, it was in the middle of the recession, <laughs> which is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my entire life. But um, but yeah, man, I was I was rolling in one dollar bills. I remember having bricks of one dollar bills sitting up on top of uh, my closet, and I would just store them up there until I had to pay for rent, and then I'd take it all down and take it to the bank and deposit a thousand dollars worth of one dollar bills. And oh my god, it was it was weird. But I had, but I had money, you know. Yeah, we lived in a really nice place at the time. It was, you know, it was great. But um, so you're really suffering for your art then. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Well, you know, you know, it was really weird. Okay, so I had to be there early in the morning. I think I woke up at four thirty and had to be there at five or three thirty and had to be there at four, something like that. For all the early early passengers, mm-hmm. but I think I was probably there at five. So I would. Um, I would wake up at 4.30, be there at 5, work the f- first couple hours, and then it got, it's always really busy first thing in the morning at the airport, and then it chills out for a while, and that's when you go read the paper for a second. Mm-hmm. And then you come back and it gets busy again. But I was doing comedy with free hooch sometimes till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, So I would finish working with free hooch, uh, go home, sleep for a couple of hours, and then go straight back out to the airport. But then I had a lot of odd jobs too, because I was, I had started teaching like in the summers at Sac State. I was in a special program teaching improv. Um, um, you know, I did this odd job, that odd job, and so I was just always. It felt like I was always working. I got off at one o'clock. I would go home and be with the family for a while, and then rehearsals were always later on that night, like at uh, six or seven o'clock mm-hmm. or something. So, but it was just, it was crazy. I was just up all the time and never slept. It was just. You know, like I'd maybe take a nap in between someplace, but it was just, it was always doing something and always tired. Which was good practice for how things are now. For kinda? everything yeah. in my life, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's kind of it, yeah. So you were, you said you made a switch at some point to uh, to doing comedy as a day job yeah. and a night job. <laughs> like, What was that decision like? Uh well, all right. So, I knew, I knew I had to. I knew I had, I, I had to go all in on this thing because we moved to the Mars Building, which yeah. is a great location. It really is. But you know, the rent was way more expensive then. Um, we still weren't making a ton of money. We were trying to figure out how to be able to um, have entertainment more than one night a week. Because at the old place, we just did. Friday nights. And mm. Really, that was it. That building is located in Midtown Sacramento, Sacramento's trendiest neighborhood. And while that may not sound like much to some people, the city itself is really growing. Sac is currently the fastest growing big city in California and just topped half a million residents. That doesn't even include the surrounding areas. That's just within the city itself. Some of that growth is probably because the high cost of living in the Bay Area is pushing people in our direction. And some of it is that the city is actually working on being a cooler place to live with additions like the new Kings Arena down downtown and all the developments surrounding it. On a Saturday night, it's a challenge to find parking in Midtown near the comedy spot. It's surrounded by bars, restaurants, coffee houses, and clubs that are, as people around here like to say, hella crowded. I remember the first show I saw at the comedy spot had a packed house, and I thought, why haven't I been here before? And you were doing a, 
Are we doing improv or sketch or a mixture of the two? Or when we opened up, th- there was a, a weird time between the time the comedy spot opened and we started doing live performances inside the comedy spot. Initially, we were just going to use it for classes and oh, then do okay. perform performances other places. But we were still running into problems where. We couldn't book places, or it was just a wrong match. So finally, koi ponds. And- yeah, exactly. But when we first opened, the comedy spot was painted like orange and blue and yellow, and the idea was <laughs> <laughs> it was a mistake. The idea was that we would. It was like a kids' playground, and you would go there, right? But uh, we had this guy come in, and he did a performance. Uh, and he says it, it felt like performing inside of clown's underwear. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, yeah, that's probably not cool. So, so, so really, 2007 is when we painted everything black inside. It was a true black box theater, uh-huh. and that's when it started to be cool. You know, it's like um, then it, then it was a theater theater, uh, but we were only doing shows one night a week on Friday nights, uh-huh. and then I, I think we had like open mic on Saturday or Sunday, but. Um, but going from that to a 30-seat house where we're selling out and we're very excited we're selling out at 30 people to a space where you can fit 100 people yeah, and the ability to have shows more than one night a week, we had to to be able to pay the rent. Right. And I think a lot of it – and back then we didn't have a bar. We didn't have any beer. Mm. So it was just ticket sales and classes. But, I mean, I guess at the time when I decided – to leave i was like oh we're doing pretty good like with this money that's coming in i can get by but then um that's when i started going through a divorce um that's when the economy fell apart Mm -hmm. uh so all these you know all these i bought a car the year before (laughs) and so um everything went to shit my life went to shit and um so i'm trying to you know, run a business now, and that's my sole source of income. Um, and then I can't make any money off of it. So at one point, I went back and started working at a diner in the morning, bussing tables and trying to be a server. And mm-hmm. I'm a terrible server, by the way. I would never make it in L.A. I'm a terrible server. <laughs> terrible server. Um, lost my car. Um, so I would gotten a ticket. And then I didn't pay the ticket because I didn't have any money, which meant the ticket went through the roof, which meant I lost my license, which meant, um, and then I couldn't pay for my car payment because I was taking all the money from work, work, from working there uh-huh. and putting it into keeping the comedy spot alive. Oh, my God. And so uh, I was hiding my car at my parents' house because I didn't want to get repossessed. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to get money together. And finally, they were like, listen, we're going to come pick up that car no matter what. Now, you can give it to us. And we'll sell it and we'll give you the difference, you mm. know, or we're just going to take it. And I was like, why don't you come over and pick up that car? So I had no car, no license, no nothing. People are driving me around and helping me with kids. And it was stupid. It was just, it was the worst time. It was the worst time. So I'm asking this question because it isn't, it isn't a gimme. Did yeah. you, did you regret getting into this position or did, were you so, were you hopeful enough for what the future might offer that you were like, I can, I can deal with this. Although it sucks. It was, I'm really, I'm way better at comedy than I am at anything else in, in my life. Like I'm way better on stage and teaching than I am being a human being. <laughs> I'm neurotic. Um, the thing is, is I try to do the right thing. I try to be a good person. I'm always trying to do my best to, take care of me, take care of my kids, take care of people around me. Uh-huh. Um, so I felt terrible that I had gotten in this position that I had no money, you know, and every, all this stuff. Had, and all decisions, I'm not blaming anybody except for myself. Right. I caused this. Yeah. You know, I put, uh, I put myself in this position. So, um, but I would always, even before we even opened up the club, every couple years i would think like maybe it's time to not do this anymore Mm -hmm. and i was like well either i'm gonna leave it behind or i'm gonna make it successful what do i have to do to make it successful and so then i would be like all right well here here it is are we quitting or are we all in you know and then it it was always all right i'm all in what what's going to get us to the next Mm -hmm. level and i can't tell you like 
That has happened almost every two years since I've been doing this. And at that time, I think that was my lowest time. I saw all this potential. I knew it was right there. I mm. knew that we could make this happen. And I was just like, screw it. We're all in. I'll work, I'll work 24 hours a day if I have to. And, you know, I put in more time than I ever did. That on top of, um, I have 50 50 custody with my kids. Mm-hmm. So I have them pretty much every day of the week. So I take them to school, pick them up from school, you know, drop them off, pick them up, homework stuff. And then mom comes over in the evenings and picks them up and has them over overnight. Mm-hmm. And we do that every single day. That's every single day. So that was that schedule. So I'm working in between dropping off kids and picking them up and then being with them and trying to be with them on weekends. And so it's always like fitting everybody into little increments and still being able to get work done. But a big part of me regretted it. But you're right. I did see the potential. And so I just went all in. I just whatever I had to do. Like even if, there was one point where I was hired by Southwest Airlines to be a manager. I'd worked for them, you know, out there for them for mm-hmm. years, even though I wasn't with their company. They had a manager's job open up and they said, you know, it's yours. And I, I said, well, what are the hours? <laughs> and they said, it's a bidding system, which means you'll probably have to work Fridays and Saturday nights. And I was like, I, I can't do that. And so I had to sit down and was like, should I take this job or should I do this? I got to mm-hmm. choose one. And it was always, I'll choose the comedy spot. So I've always seen potential. I still see potential. We're not where I want us to be. Mm-hmm. I think in five years we will be. We're close to where I want us to be. We're, I'm getting to the point where I don't want to just keep adding stuff. I want to make everything that we have really, really good. Um, improve the quality as much as possible. Get us to a point where we have our own building. Uh, where we don't have to pay lease to somebody. Mm-hmm. Again, having that control is so important because we don't make a ton of money. You know, so every every dollar that we can save by doing it ourselves makes way more sense than throwing it away to somebody else. So yeah, but um, but yeah, even this year, I think this past year was one of the hardest years I've ever had. Not money wise, but just figuring out how to be a better manager. You know, trying to work on quality of shows and opening up a new training center. But even even this past year, I was asking myself, should I get out of this? Could I get out of it now and give it to somebody else and it not die? You know, uh, what would I do too was another question, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it has potential. I'll, I'll never quit this thing until I think, until I think that it just, I, mean, I won't let it die. That's the thing. I'm trying to set it up so that I can walk away Maybe in five years, mm-hmm. and give it to somebody else and do something else. I don't want to do that, um, but I want to make it so that if something would happen to me, it would continue on. That's what this last two years has been about. Like if if I go, I want there to be something left over, which is weird. I'm 43 and I'm talking like I'm 69 or something <laughs> like that. You know, like I'm on the verge of things. So it's. A fairly remarkable thing just in Sacramento to have the 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 comedy spot, which is you, know, you have shows six nights a week, six nights a week, yeah. Plus you have classes, a lot of classes. Yeah, classes, multiple classes, four nights a week. Um, and how many of those are you teaching yourself? I teach um, I teach three nights a week now, and then on the. The other night where I used to teach, I direct shows um, that go up at the comedy spot later on in the week. Mm. So I'm always there at night. Let's talk about actually the split between sort of comedy theater and the kind of legitimate theater. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. scripted. Like, like the difference between us and B Street. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, I think companies like B Street, companies like ours are really good i think that we both really care about about the end product it's just that we do we're totally different you know Mm -hmm. um even it took me a long time to call myself a comedian i was always like i'm an an actor Mm -hmm. and then and then eventually i was like no no i'm just a comedian (laughs) you know my job is to make people laugh there's no drama in what i do Mm -hmm. am i a good actor on top of a being a comedian yeah i think i I have pretty good acting chops, you know, but, um, but they, they are there for, I mean, 
we do art, but we do a different art, and it's for one reason. You mm-hmm. know, they do art and they do comedies. You know, but they also do dramas and musicals and things like right. that. Which is funny because we do musicals, but it's for one reason to make people laugh. Um, when it gets when you, I think when you boil it down, we're really not doing. What we're doing is not substantially different, except that they put in a lot of audition times and do productions, and mm-hmm. it's. Productions by people, you know, writers and classic stuff and newer stuff. And where all of our things are like made for sketch comedy, made for sketch comedy shows, just for, you know, just for making people laugh. I think that's the only difference. But when you look at it, our business models are really similar. Yeah, that was my question. I think my, like, in terms of, um, like, you don't, you don't have like, like season ticket members or anything right. like that. Right. But, in terms of being able to just fill fill a house all the time, that's that's a, a fairly critical component. Sure, yeah, and we're getting better at that. It's, yeah, I think um, it's always a hard thing. Is how do you attract? All right, here's the thing. All right, what what what, what product do you really like? Do you have a product that you really like? Uh, a simple product. Diet Coke. I'm Diet a, Coke. All yeah. right. So um, I would say that Diet Coke is a product. That a lot of people know about, right? right? And they're familiar with they're familiar with soda. And if they've yeah. had one soda, they know that the, the other soda probably tastes the same, right? Right. Now, I'm trying to sell you improv, <laughs> and I'm like, "Hey, you should come to my comedy show." And you're like, "Oh, well, who's playing?" You know. And I'm like, "Uh, well, like me and G- Greg, <laughs> 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 M- Melissa, and Chris. Oh, who, who are they? <laughs> yeah, exactly." So I'm trying to sell you a product that you don't care about. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody knows what improv is until you go see it. They they know stand up. You right. know, that's the cola they're familiar with. You know, but I'm trying to sell you I don't know, like herbal tea or something yeah. like that or some sort of like new tea that came out of some other country it's brand new. So it's hard because I'm I'm not selling a traditional product. And so it took a long time to build a base of people who it's like we had to educate them before they could even become a fan of what we do, you know? Right. That's why people who take the classes, I think, um, come to so many shows because they enjoy, they understand how difficult it is and what the process is to get better and how long it takes to be able to do improv well. So it's been hard. And I mean, you're you're selling you're selling your branding, right? You're selling your comedy spot branding, right? You're selling the experience of being there, right? And and hopefully people get that that the improv is, you know, is high quality. Right. Right. But I think let's face it, improv's been the butt. Like even stand up comedians, a lot of them hate improv, you right. know? Like their perception of improv is like, Oh, you're gonna get up there and be silly pants and you know, play a little game and uh oh get a suggestion, <laughs> yes and blah, 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 blah. you know, so it's like um we're not even respected by other comedians. <laughs> so it's just hard. I think people hear about improv shows, and if you have a bad time, other people tell it, oh, yeah, don't go see improv. It's crappy. And I think some people don't do it as well as us, mm-hmm. and, and it's hard if you go see a show where it's not good, and then you don't want to sample somebody else's product. You know, Right. That's why I'm really – I try to keep our shows top-notch. The comedians that end up on our stage go through – training uh farm teams and mm-hmm. then they eventually end up on a main stage but they're the best of the best so you um you put a whole lot into to teaching mm-hmm. and i think you're very good at oh, it oh thank you thank um you. And I, I didn't just bring here to, to stroke you on that point, oh no but this it's okay is, um they, i i have seen a lot of people present different things over the years and you're kind of in that sort of top level the top two or three people that I've ever mm-hmm. seen present anything just because um, the your manner and the information click together so well. Thank you. Well, this this turned out to be a better day than I thought. <laughs> what else about me? Talk about me. I'll just sit here and listen. Well, uh, here's another here's a, a thing that I really admire other than the fact that you have like created this this comedy theater that is at least self-sustaining mm-hmm. yeah and you're you're supporting yourself with it in a town that has been through a lot i mean the the fucking symphony went belly up the ballet has gone 
bell, belly up. You know, I mean, it's it's hard to keep the arts going here mm-hmm. unless you can hit a certain price point and you can guarantee a certain level of enjoyment. Yeah, I think I think that that's like I'm that's it number one thing that I'm amazed by. But the other thing that that I am always impressed about is that you can just fucking commit to whatever you're doing and just let it go. Yeah. And that's kind of like that's if there's one thing that I wanted to be involved in and take classes for was to, to figure out was that 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 like how do I let it go? Yeah. And I I'm struggling with it every fucking day. And I I I've, I've been listening to uh to UCB's long form conversation podcast yeah, and every single one that i listen to everybody who's been doing it for a long time is still having that struggle yeah yeah that yeah. the confidence to just like just follow it wherever it goes and and totally commit to the character commit to the scene whatever and you just don't seem to have a problem with that maybe i mask it well maybe so <laughs> but but that's but that's a talent too you know so i i Wow. Well, right. I'm trying to like. I don't get. I don't get nervous going on stage, and I don't think about it when I'm on stage. I think about it after I get off stage. So, when I'm on stage, I just try to have a good time. I mean, I try to. How many times in a class have I said like, uh, you know, like, hey, if you're not having fun, the audience isn't having fun. Right. Just have a good time, right? Right. Easier said than done. For sure. Um, but I try to practice what I preach. And when I go on stage, I never go into a show. Okay, hold on. There was one time I went into a show <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I feel good. I'm going to crush it tonight, you know? And it was the worst show I'd ever done. And I think the goal was crushing it mm. instead of the goal having like a really good time and enjoying and being in the moment, mm-hmm. you know? And from then on out, I never say that to myself anymore. Like I'll, when I go on stage now, I think to a lot of times I'll think to myself, what, what's going to make a good show? Stay positive on stage, support other people, um, are my two main goals when I go out on stage. And so I just, I just try to have a good time. I put in a lot of work teaching. I'm around it all the time. I know, the rules and I see what other people do and how I can be better. And, um, but I don't think about that when I'm on stage, I'm just there to have a good time. I want to, I love it when people come up to me after shows and like, I like my, my jaw hurts. I'm laughing so hard. <laughs> my jaw hurts. You know, somebody told me last night, I, I, it was so much fun last night. We did a show called three, two, one sizzle, which we haven't done for a while. And somebody said, um, I was watching the audience and people were crying, literally crying in the audience. They were laughing so hard. And I was like, that's great. You I know? usually have to take my glasses off because <laughs> because of that. It was so much fun. But I, So I don't know if there's a key. Just think for, if it looks easy now, for years, all I did was think about don't fail, don't fail. You know, mm-hmm. the whole thing, I think the reason I had such bad stage fright is because I thought about, Everything, how my wife or how, how yeah how my wife at the time would think of me on stage. My parents, you know, am I going to forget lines? Am I look at how I'm dressed? Do I look stupid? Am I going to? Does my voice sound right? You know. Mm-hmm. God, yeah. Once I got over that, I never have that anymore. I've never had stage fright since. That's never happened ever since. You know, I was in my early twenties, mid twenties. Um, it just doesn't happen anymore. And I think I just got to the point by doing this over and over and over again, failing over and over and over again, <laughs> where you just know, like, if I just have fun, it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. If I just have a good time. Uh, it's funny what you said about crushing it. Reminded me of something that happened in high school. I was <laughs> in, a, in a musical, and um, a couple of a couple of the of the numbers, a bunch of us were not on stage, and so we were sort of chorus in, right. the, in the back, right? And we had a we it was a community show. We had a pianist who was in from somewhere, really really good. She was kind of sort of the musical director of the whole thing. I have an okay voice. I don't yeah. have a great voice. I have an okay voice. But in the context of of a particular song, like I was pretty good. And one night she was like, you know, you're really you're you're doing really good job. You sound really good. Well, thank and, you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. So the next time. 
I was fucking wailing. <laughs> and she's like, can you just back it off a notch? <laughs> and Easy. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, yeah, you get exuberance for for uh, some kind of a you know, a good performance or achievement right. or whatever, and that's just when you fall, you know? I, I, I love, I hate failing when you're in the middle of a fail, <laughs> right? When you're like, ah, oh, this is really bad. But I like failing afterward because I, the, I, I, I can pick apart what I did wrong and be like, all right, well, I'll never do that again, <laughs> you know? Like, I will try to avoid that at all costs. So that brings me to another point. Yeah. Um, the Herald is not my favorite thing. No, it's nobody's favorite. <laughs> so, and I know you like it. I'd love it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and and one of the reasons one of the reasons it's not one of my favorite things is that you, is because of the repeating structure. Yeah, I will I will cut in here and explain what the Herald is. Okay, here's your extremely short course in improv comedy. When I say improv, I'll bet that most of you think of the TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? That's short form improv. Short form uses a series of suggestions throughout the show to create a series of three to four minute scenes, entirely made up, that probably have no relationship to each other, different settings, different characters, etc. In long form improv, a team of performers gets one suggestion from the audience and then develops its own constellation of related topics to create a series of scenes totaling 25 minutes or more. The Herald is one type of long form and the backbone of the Herald is three rounds of three two-person scenes. Each scene has an unusual character and the unusual thing about that character becomes the pattern that's pointed out, humorously, you hope, throughout each scene. The other person is typically the grounded character or kind of a straight man of the scene. Each round of scenes features the same characters pushed forward in time or backward in time or somewhat different characters exploring other aspects of the same unusual pattern. The Herald has been around since the 60s and it's morphed a few times along the way. It's become a major teaching tool for long form improv. You know when you take English and they teach you the five paragraph essay? The Herald is kind of the five paragraph essay of improv comedy. Just like writing, once you really understand the rules, the more impact and perverse pleasure you get from breaking them. It takes a while to get there and you can definitely produce some garbage along the way. Um, however, if your first beats, if one of the first beat scenes or or more than one of the first beat scenes <coughs> suck, mm -hmm. like the whole thing might not go well. And as... A, as a performer or in the audience, you just want to, th is there, is there, is there a meteor that can land in this space and, and, and make this not happen anymore? Or I think that, we, I think that <laughs> first of all, I, I, if the first scene goes bad, I know that, you know, the whole show is repeating off that first thing or meant to, right. But, but really, who gives a shit? <laughs> like, if your first team, if your first scene sucks, I would, I would jump ship. Like, I just when I would do the Herald, if that first scene sucked, I would not do the second scene. I would not go back to anything that I did. I would take the one nugget, if anything, got a laugh or even a. <laughs> that's the thing that's that I went thing. with in the second and third beat. So, I, I like Herald as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. It's not my favorite structure to watch, and it because it is more difficult. I think people really get in their head about the structure, and the structure, um, the structure of it influences the show quality. But as a teaching tool, it has a lot of really cool things to teach performers. You know, group scenes and and revisiting scenes and openings, fun openings mm -hmm. to do. And I mean, there's so many things in this Herald structure that are fun to teach skills to be had, uh, for later on. But, um, but I get it. It's not everyone's favorite, but from what I understand of what like Del Close, who's like the godfather of improv, who helped invent the Herald structure. The thing is, is he hated structure. He, he wanted everybody to just do whatever they, whatever, mm. whatever they felt he wanted them to go after, you know? And, and uh, so I think that teaching the structure makes people think that they have to stick to the structure so much that they're not free to create. 
uh, which is the way, way, way downside of Harold. Yeah. And so, but it's also puts us in a weird position because I think a lot of people from out of town, like LA, mm-hmm. they'll come here and say, oh, you have a Harold night? That's cool. Like it's as like it's something exclusive to bigger markets, you know. Uh-huh. And so I fear getting rid of it, just in going with something else, just because. Well, one, I really do. I do like the Herald. I know people don't. But I really like it. Um, but two, just for that, uh, does it make us a lesser club? Does it make us not legitimate as these bigger clubs if we don't have a Herald program? Um, but I, I love the Herald. I really do. I wish other people shared my love for it. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I did. And sometimes I, I do. I know. Sometimes I do. When it's, when it's good, it's good. Yeah. When it's good, it's really, really good. And, and when it's not, it's, it's a little bit of a slog. And yeah. it's, it's such a mental game trying to figure out how to get out of a hole that you've dug yourself. Yeah. And, and not everybody is easy to play with. Right in a in in a particular in, type of seat, especially in classes, especially and, in classes. Yeah, sure. I I agree. With you. <laughs> yeah, I I wish I could. Um, I wish I could leap inside people's brains and be like, "Don't think about the structure." You know, like think about the structure in class. I mean, obviously there is a structure there, but um, it's not it's not meant to be. It should be porous. It should be fun, mm-hmm. um, experimental, and we're even revamping our classes so that we do more scene work and uh, front mm-hmm. end, just to give people that freedom, so that they don't think of Harold as as this like rigid structure and make it more fluid. Um, but once you aren't thinking of it as a structure anymore, I think it's a lot more fun and freeing. You know, it's just. Um, when you can think of it more of it, more as a suggestion, a schedule, uh, a yeah, and not so much a tightly constrained thing. But I think you have to be, I think you have to be fairly comfortable as a performer to make that work. And I think that's why we're that's see that's the thing is that's why we're redoing our our curriculum so that we make people more comfortable with scenes, so they're thinking less about the structure. If they're having if. If they can successfully do scenes and be happy in their scene performance and feel comfortable there, mm-hmm. I don't think the structure is going to be as daunting as it is. And so we're the new the new uh, classes that we're setting up. You won't even really get heavy into Harold structure until the third class, which is what I think it needs to be. You need to be really comfortable performing in scenes before you move on to the structure. So. I, I agree. I think I think a lot of people look at Harold and they're like, "No, f this. This is so hard." You know, for me, I'm like, "Ooh, playtime!" You know, for, like, "Oh, there's eight of us on stage. We can do so many things." Yeah. And I think uh, for other people, it's like, "Oh, this is very A to B to C to D." And and I've always colored outside the lines, so I'm I'm okay with it. <laughs> it's like, uh, I mean, you could tell me what to do, but I probably won't do. What you're telling me to do? So l- let me ask you this question: If is that um, does that feed into maybe a, a lack of desire to play a consistent character over a period of time? Because for a lot of actors, that's the thing. Like if I if, if you can if you can do a, a a few week run of of a play, yeah. where you're playing a consistent character, and you, so, there is definitely exploration that happens with sure. that. You deliver lines differently from night to night, sure. or you start to getting an insight that you didn't have <coughs> in rehearsal, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you play, you do, a, you do a character like once a month, right? One, the uh, ding dong. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I play a a, a bear, <laughs> escape from a circus. Yeah, yeah. Once a month, I do that. Um, yeah, I I don't like doing. I like be I like really being creative. I like the rawness of improv. Like, you know, like last night was just really fun. Um, there were several scenes, like Mel Gelbart, she's uh, she's one of the people that have been with me for years. Mm-hmm. She did this scene last night that was based on the movie The Matrix, because they had, we were doing, <laughs> we were doing improv scenes inspired by burlesque routines. <laughs> 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 and one of the burlesque routines was this Matrix themed. So, uh, so Mel starts the scene and she's wearing a black jacket that she's picked up from the ground from one of the burlesque. Uh-huh. 
And this guy in the audience was right next to these sunglasses that they had tossed away. And he looks at me, and I look at this guy in the audience, and he has the glasses. And I made the sign like throw them to me. He throws them to me. I grab him in midair, put him on Mel's, put him on Mel's face. And she does. Uh, she said, she stands there for a second. She looks badass, and she goes, "Welcome to Burger King. Can I? What would you like today?" And they said a Whopper. And she goes. Okay, and then she goes into this bullet time where she goes back, <laughs> where she goes backwards, and she grabs the whopper off the thing and then puts it on the counter. <laughs> and I was just like, "That's so weird. That's so that's so much fun." I just remember being on stage and I'm like, "Oh, oh, nicely done." But it was a lot of those moments last night where it's it was just really super fun and creative and um. Yeah, I, I like I like the rawness of that. I like plays. I used, you know I, I would like I said I wasn't a lot of comedy plays, but man, I love being able to create every night. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's from your brain. It's like you're, it's it's terrible because you're writing it and performing it at the same time. Yeah, and you never get to see it again. It, it just That's goes another, away. That's you know? Be, being a, a very long time YouTube guy and a pretty long time podcast guy, I, I just look at the stage and there's like content littered all over it. Yeah. I just want to scoop it up. Yeah. And, it's sad, right? I mean, it like, is. It's it's like it's uh, um, performance ephemera, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, think like this like, everything I create. <laughs> An improv will never exist. Like people will be like, "Oh, yeah, Brian's you know Brian's hella funny." Oh, can I can I see him on YouTube? No, no. you can't see him on YouTube. <laughs> so if you don't go to a show, you won't have any way. Uh, like it won't be remembered. When every one of our audience members dies, I will cease to exist. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I never did anything, but. Um, but I love the raw creativity of of improv. I wouldn't change it for anything. I don't I don't like to be stuck in anything for too long. Um, we when I took the first class with yeah. you, we were talking about reasons why people take improv classes, yeah. and um, a lot of people come into it thinking that it's going to help them have more poise or whatever in, a, yeah. in in particular situations. But I think the thing that you said that impressed me the most was that you. Um, uh, you just get comfortable with the idea that that it's okay to fuck up. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like, what's the worst thing that can possibly happen? Right. And um, you know, business situations sometimes bad things can happen. <laughs> yeah. But you hope you're in a better, you're in a good enough position so that so that uh, if something just doesn't work, it's not going to be the end of 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 the road. But, right. Well, I think. Yeah, I mean, oh, by the way, I did a workshop for, I did a workshop for, uh, I think it was um, uh, medical medical people, you know, people who give care, uh-huh. and <laughs> I said, um, I'm really lucky. I'm in a I'm in a job where if we fail, we learn from our failures. So I was like, <laughs> I don't think you guys have the liberty of failing too much, <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know, like, I. Like I said earlier, I'm I'm a pretty neurotic person. Like, I, I I really like to make sure that we put on the best product. I work really hard um, to make sure things are as as perfect as mm-hmm. we can, they can possibly be. Um, you know, I see things like last night. I was backstage during the show, and I turned to the tech person. I was like, "Do you see that little scuff mark on the wall? We should we should probably wipe wipe that down." <laughs> like everything to me is like this. Uh, huge deal. A um, little bit of OCD. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more than a little bit. Uh, hey. um, so, <laughs> but um, improv has been good for me because for that reason. I mean, like, get over yourself, man. Like, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do dumb shit. Um, you're going to embarrass yourself. Um, you're going to say the wrong thing. And at the end of the day, it's it's not the it's not the end to end times when you make a mistake. You know, yeah. people are human, and I think a lot of people are like me. We we wake up each morning. We're trying to do the right thing. You know, we're trying to do right by family. We're trying to uh, we're trying to do right by other people. Um, but we are humans, and we we screw up. You know, we screw up all the time. 
But I think the person who screws up and, and A, doesn't realize they screwed up and they just keep on going about their day mm-hmm. and don't take stock in the fact that they made a mistake um, are not, aren't going to be happy. But um, if you just realize, like, you're going to make mistakes, how can I not make that mistake next time? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why improv's great because you're going to screw up every time you do it. You're going to do something dumb or you're going to finish a show and be like, I should have done that. Um but um, but don't take it too seriously. I mean, got to get over it, move on, and and learn from it. So, do you think that that people outside of 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 comedy particularly benefit from taking improv? Or yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I don't think people. A lot of people don't ever take improv classes. For me, anyway, that want to be performers. Most of the people that start off doing improv mm-hmm. didn't, didn't do it because they had this dream of being an improv performer Mm -hmm. where they make very little money and um i think a lot of people do it because they want to try something new and they don't want to you know they maybe they're not sports inclined you know maybe a little little introverted or um not you know not very confident but then you get into our community and i think you realize really fast that everyone's kind of the same everyone's Mm -hmm. trying to you know um just try to do something new and have a good time and then you start meeting people and you realize, oh, they're all they're I always say that the comedy spot is just a collection of misfit toys. Like we're the <laughs> you know, we're the people that are longing for some sort of community. And I think the uh the comedy spot has, you know, really diverse uh, people people from all diverse backgrounds coming together in one place and you're there and you're laughing for two hours a night and um you're having a good time. Uh, I think people benefit from that. I think people need that. I mean, mm-hmm. if people, I think we stay indoors a lot. We get into the same routine. And I think a lot of people that take classes at Comedy Spot want to get out of that routine and they want to do something different. Um, and so I th- I do think it helps people. I, I've had people come to me and, you know, s- some people it's just like, hey, this is this is really good. I'm really glad I took this class. And mm-hmm. some people have come to me and said, you saved my life, you know. And yeah. I was like, um, I was like, well, uh, wow, you know, like I, did, I, I'm glad you found us. You were looking for something. You right. needed something. And so when I get compliments like that, like I'm glad that we're here, you know. I think I was listening to something this morning talking about um, very early this morning about about connectedness and how how there's so much less of it these days mm-hmm. and that like the kind of universally the 24, 25 to thirty four age group mm-hmm. uh, suffers from depression and loneliness at a higher level than uh, anybody but uh, folks over like sixty five mm-hmm. and it's that. They just get disconnected. Like you don't, yeah. you don't have anybody else. You don't have you don't have your college friends to hang with anymore. Right. If right. especially if you moved for a job or something sure. like that, you just don't have that sense of community with anybody. Yeah. If, you're just, if you're not a churchgoer, if you don't have any of those other things, like how do you how do you connect with people? Well, and that's the thing is, you know, you have a lot of people that don't go to church anymore, yeah. and they don't have a support system, and so they're they're looking for something, and all of us are working more. You know, like people who, uh, I mean, I say I don't work nine to five, but I do. I just don't go to an office. I work from home most of the time. Mm -hmm. But, I I mean, we all get up in the morning. We go to a job. We're there all day. And then we get home and then we have to take care of family. And we don't don't make any time for ourselves. I'm the worst at that. You know, I I give a lot to uh, everybody in the club and and kids and girlfriend, but I don't take a lot of time for myself which i'm trying to be a better at that you know is ink out some time but everybody's looking for a community right now they want to fit in someplace i mean i think that's why you have groups like uh you know the sports group that's in town where you can go and uh you can play dodgeball and stuff like that right you know which is an excuse to go drinking and hang out with people crossfit is kind of similar to that sure there's there's everybody talks about the crossfit community and it's (laughs) it's really true that's the that's the thing that you don't get out of, you know, a globo gym, a you know, twenty four hour fitness or right. whatever. You, know, you might see the same people, but you don't really have the interaction with them, and you're not, you're not sharing a particular experience. With right. Them. Well, I've heard that CrossFit 
you know, I've seen videos and stuff where they talk about CrossFit being a cult, and you know, like everybody it is a little bit. Every, but so is the comedy spot. We get, oh, yeah. we get called out for it too. You know, you start dressing like everybody else, mm-hmm. and you know, you all know the same lingo, and you're all mm-hmm. trying to strive to do something better. And the only thing about you just sweat less and improv. That's the <laughs> best thing. Is <laughs> we take everybody <laughs> physically fit or not. <laughs> We're here for you. Uh, actually, that's a that's a point. That's something that because um, I had mentioned on my my last show that uh, that when I was in high school, particularly the first theater program that I was involved in, uh, there were a lot of jocks mm-hmm. in 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 class, and, and people were calling me out on YouTube saying that never happens. It's like no, it totally happened in my high school. Oh, for sure, me too. And and I in th- the the comedy spot totally reflects that too. You have you have everybody. Type oh, we there. have everybody. Yeah, we do. Which is that's great. It is great. Like like, uh, <laughs> I love it. Like I love our I love our place. I love going in there. There are people, if not for the comedy spot, people. Some people would never have met each other and hung out. Like when you, at least there's a certain guy, guy that takes classes and you he you could tell he just spends a lot of time at the gym and he's really physically fit and stuff like that but when you see that guy talking to another guy that's that would never be at a gym would Mm. never do crossfit or anything like that and they're all in the same space and they're laughing and having a good time and they're all on the same plane like that's pretty cool and what might come of it is the person who doesn't go to a gym might Start going with that person to go do CrossFit. I mean, because we've had people that are like yoga people. Yeah. And then they've started little yoga classes inside and done yoga together. And, you know, like I really like paintball and I got a bunch of people to go do paintball. And, you know, it's like, you know, like you're trading all these things and you're having all these new experiences. And, you know, there's been um, a handful of people that have gotten married because of the comedy spot who would have. N- we're like Tinder. <laughs> Swipe right on the comedy spot. Like people, people, I mean, I mean, great. I mean, just people have met there and then they've they've dated and then uh, got married. They have kids now, you know. Uh-huh. Um, but those are people that wouldn't have ever found each other if not for that. You know, I have lifelong friends um, that I would never have met. If it wasn't for the comedy spot, so yeah, I mean it is bigger than a comedy club. It's it's just a place where a lot of diverse people can come together and and uh, trade ideas and beliefs and things like that, and nobody judges them. You know, yeah. like I'm, okay, uh, nobody is a big word. I'm sure there's some people in the community that don't believe in this and don't believe mm-hmm. in that, but they don't get in the middle. They don't get in front of their beliefs. They don't stop them. They don't try to convert them to believe something else. You know, it's. I think everybody is, for the most part, is very respectful of what people bring to the table, and because of that, you have all this cross pollination, which is fantastic. I can only speak about it from the from the uh, from the educational side, and and not having not being in you know on the inside of what goes on with the performers but mm-hmm. it is sort of the least clicky bitchy theater group i've ever been involved <laughs> no. with. Yeah. like a lot i agree i agree yeah because um <laughs> yeah i've been in in theater programs where certain people didn't hang out with other people and, yeah um i think all that's crap there's not enough time for that you know like <laughs> i yeah, I I really like our community. I I I look around and I'm like, this look at all these people who would never have known each other, mm-hmm. you know? Never ever. And then they just stumble in and some of them are friends forever now, you know? It's pretty great. Last semi-serious question, why the Intero bang? Uh, let's see. Um so I was looking for a logo element and I think I was listening to a story on NPR and they were talking about how the interrobang used to be a punctuation mark that was um that people would use. It was a legit punctuation mm-hmm. mark. <coughs> and then they it couldn't fit on the typewriter. They only had room for so many keys. I think this is how the story goes. Go back, uh, do some research. But they will. basically <laughs> got rid of the the interrobang like it's just it wasn't a legit punctuation mark anymore i was listening to that so that was going through my head you know i was just like oh that's really cool that's a really neat thing you know this weird punctuation mark 
and then we were trying to we were trying to get better at branding you know having them uh oh that's them and um we had a really cheesy <laughs> we had a really cheesy uh uh logo when we were at the old comedy spot it said like comedy sacramento comedy spot and the o was like a spotlight in the middle mm. And I was just like, oh, God, I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I made that decision. It's terrible. And so it's like every gym that has a bending barbell in the oh, logo. Yeah, you're like, stop it. Yeah. So I was like, well, we have to change that. We need something that's like weird, you know, like uh, the AT&T world or something like yeah. that. Or we need something that catch people's eye. And and then it just kind of went like, but those two uh, things okay. came together. And I was like, oh, well, let's do that. And so. That's how the Interrobang became like the logo element, which I think it's really cool. I mean, it just it looks it weird. It fits. It's it serves the purpose. I yeah. think. I always tell really people, well. you know, because the Interrobang is meant to be like a what? You know that kind of uh, that kind of uh, punctuation mark. But that's kind of what we're doing anyway. Like you look at things, <laughs> and you're like, what? What's going on? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's a weird thing, but I. I've, really like it i'm glad that we i settled on that so <laughs> so where can people find you okay um all the social media at uh brian c comedy and uh sackcomedyspot.com uh but the comedy spot is uh, operated by the sacramento comedy foundation which is uh the nonprofit that runs everything and that's at sacramento comedy foundation.org so and you have a podcast do have a podcast, Top Ten List Podcast. Uh, iTunes, you can download it there. Um, if if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing it right now. <laughs> you just you just added a whole another uh, three hours onto my plate every week. <laughs> so right. we're a little no, hey, I love it. We're a little behind on episodes, but we're going to be dropping two uh, fresh episodes soon, so uh, they can listen to those. Awesome. Yeah. And I always like to do uh, the beginning at the end. So give me your name, and then how would you describe yourself? Okay. Uh, Brian Crawl, um, president, founder of the Sacramento Comedy Spot. There we go. All, All right. right. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. My thanks to Brian for taking time out of his crazy busy schedule to be on the show. A short coda to this story, this conversation actually helped me a lot in the last few class sessions and our class performance in front of a sort of real audience a couple of days ago on stage at the Comedy Spot. So thanks to Brian for that, too. On the next episode of the Less Than Obvious podcast, I'm going to update a story that's near and dear to me from an episode of my previous show. Will Hoover talks about his continuing recovery from being wounded in an international incident in Afghanistan and receiving a Bronze Star with Valor for his actions there. So when I started uh, experimenting not taking meds for a day to see how my pain was and try to differentiate it, and this is about a year and a half outside of the attack, try to differentiate the withdrawal pain from the actual pain and I realized like I can deal with this pain like this is an aching pain it's annoying like yeah it hurts to walk but if I can get off the pain meds it's gonna be so much better because then I can actually think about stuff I can actually have memories because the pain meds were clogging up my memory I couldn't remember anything mm-hmm. and I was a different person on meds I did not like that I, if I got angry I got really angry I was uh I remember throwing things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of the story that we couldn't tell last time, so be sure to join us. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on the platform of your choice and rate and review it on iTunes, whether or not you listen to the show there. That's still where most people go to find new podcasts, and good ratings always help people find the show. You can find me everywhere on social media at the Jim McD. You can find the show on social media at Less Than Obvious, except on Twitter where it's Less Than OBV, and at the website LessThanObviousPod.com. Remember, being nice doesn't cost you anything, but it can be worth a whole lot to somebody else. I'll talk to you next time.